Thank you for listening to the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast with hosts Clara and Jimmy Hinton. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe and share so you will never miss an episode. Android users can find us and subscribe on your Play Music app. Apple users can find us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. You can find us on Stitcher. You can follow us on Spreaker. And you can find the podcasts on jimmyhinton.org or findingahealingplace.com. Please rate our show, subscribe, and share so that we can spread the word. Let's get into the show. All right, welcome to this week's podcast. Here with Jimmy, hello everybody, and along with Clara. Hello everyone. Nice to be back, and this week we're uh, doing part two of Robert Caldini's book, Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. Um, This is a fascinating book, and this is very, very, very applicable. Um, If you missed last week's podcast, please, please, please go back and listen to that, Um, because this this week's won't make as much sense unless you've listened to that one first. So that's our little disclaimer. So in a nutshell, Robert Caldini identifies six foundational principles that affect influence. Um, And he talks about in in the book how the goal for, uh, whether it's marketers, um, whether it's people in sales or whatever it is, the end goal is compliance, to get people to comply. Now, when we think of compliance, uh, we think coercion. That's not what compliance means. Now, certainly you can force compliance, but he's talking about achieving compliance through persuasion. And it, it is a very, very effective technique. And it's one that abusers use. So when I read this book, um, when I juxtaposed Robert Caldini's book against uh, letters that I had received from prison from my own dad, there was this light bulb moment that went off that just, it, it made so much sense. And I was like, he is using every one of these six principles to a T. And I don't know, last week, and, you know, as we talked through that, right. did, did, did you kind of... I did. I noticed the that as well. Commonality, the the uh, co-joining of those principles, the use of them, just kind of blows you away. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes Jimmy, I think, um, so much sense when we're talking about this in line with abusers and how they get away with so much. Yeah, it, they're not being forceful. Mm-mm. No, uh, not at all. And, and that picture that we have of these abusers crouching behind a bush and jumping out at little children goes right out the window. Or, or being rude or, or being disrespectful right. no, or being loud, obnoxious. No, I'm probably louder and more obnoxious than than well, most of these abusers uh, well, are, really. Really. In public. Really. Um, but they're, when you use the word coercion, mm-hmm. what I think of is like linking arms with someone. You're making this a chain link fence, so to speak, and you are joined with them. Uh, in a peaceful way, not because you were forced, right? but it's actually one of the most uh, egregious ways of abusing people that there is. Yeah. So we're going to pick up with, uh, we're going to go through four, five, and six, principles four, five, and six this week. So the fourth principle is liking. Um, the fourth pin- principle of persuasion is liking. So what this principle says is we are far more likely to comply with people who we like. Very basic, very simple principle. And if you think about that, um, let's think about the opposite of that for a second. I noticed in in church leadership, and probably not until we discovered what we discovered about dad, and I started actually working with churches that, that have mm-hmm. these cases of abuse, but what I found out I mean, it is just as black and white as black and white can be. And that's this. People who are annoying and who frustrate leadership, they just have abrasive personalities and that's it. They're considered far more of a threat to the church and to church leadership, to the leadership structure, and to the uh, structural organization 
um, organized religion, they're considered a far mm. bigger threat than actual abusers, oppressors, murderers, um, rapists, um, people who are uh, domestic abuse, violent abusers. Um, you know why? Because those people are likable. Right. And, the, and people the, who are the, annoying uh, aren't. Right. You can't stand the person who's always contradicting what you say, mm-hmm. butting you out. Um, you know, they're the ones that sit in Bible class and they're raising their hands and saying, but wait, but wait, mm-hmm. but wait. The compliant person is just nodding their head in agreement with you. And you like that. Mm-hmm. You're automatically drawn to that person because they're in your court. Well, so and I want to say too, I want to say too, number one, abusers know this. So this is not accidental. Oh, yeah. It's not like no, they're just, they're is... just good people who went astray and, you know, abused kids or, you know, or domestic abusers started beating on their wives. It, it, it's, it's the total opposite. It's evil people. It's corrupt people who know how to masquerade really well. And so they use this principle of likability. And so as other people get frustrated, and this is an interesting uh, use of this principle, as other people get frustrated, these guys crank up the likability factor. Well, they become even more likable because that creates a very big contrast between the crazy yelling person or the opinionated person and the abuser. And what happens, I can think in, in our home with you kids, when a kid acts up, your attention goes to that kid. Mm-hmm. You automatically take your te- attention off of the quiet kid, the good kid, the mm-hmm. kid that's not making noise. The same with the abuser. They know this. When you have an, uh, a person in the group that is abrasive and people don't like their attentions on that person. They're going to yak to the yak, talk about that person. We can't, you know, stand mm-hmm. them. What are we going to do with them? You're not looking at the abuser. Right. The abuser has become the person you look to. Well, th- this for- works on so many different oh, levels. Yes. I mean, we, we could, yes. we could do 10 podcasts just on likability alone. So one of the things that I think of is, you know, um, abuse survivors. They, to leadership seem combative, even though they're not. They're typically right. not combative, but they seem opinionated. They seem combative. They usually don't take no for an answer. Like they want answers from the church leadership and they deserve answers from the church leadership. Right. Well, what the church leadership does is they see, start, start seeing the survivors as a threat because troublemakers. they're get, yeah, yes, they're yeah. troublemakers. They're they're Stirring the they're pot, dividers. The peaceful pot. Yeah. And so, what do they do? Well, they start with the platitudes. You need to just forgive. Shut your mouth. Is they might not say it that way, but no, that's what but they the, mean. The, it, the message. You need to just forgive bitter. and move on. Right. Um, you need to quit holding on to bitterness. You need to forgive your abuser, um, or. They even go so far as to say you need to reconcile with him. And you need to be the one to go to him and reconcile right. with your abuser. Meanwhile, the abuser has full court. Mm-hmm. There has Absolutely. The, the people in his hand as putty. Yep. And it's a very planned out, well thought out plan. Very, very good move, so to speak. Yes. So the other part is, um, you know, you hear the term gaslighting. and We've ref- referenced that before. Um this factor, the likability, the principle of likability becomes really important for abusers as they gaslight, uh, whether it's their spouse or whether it's just somebody in the church or in their social structure who's seen as a threat. Um, they'll make them appear to be crazy without really doing anything more than just being likable people. And so they'll, they'll point out that contrast and be like, you know what? She's just, um, in the words of my dad, oh, you know what? Your mom is just bipolar, bipolar. Yeah. which by the way, mom is not bipolar. <laughs> she has never been oh. diagnosed as bipolar. She has no signs of being bipolar, but he would say that and he would say it often. Because he planted that seed within you kids. Don't mm-hmm. listen to your mom. Don't go to her. Mm-hmm. Don't seek her for advice. She yells at you kids. I don't. Yeah. And she he didn't. Punishes he didn't you yell kids at us. for what you do. I don't. I'm your friend. Your mother, well, she's a bipolar psycho. Mm-hmm. And that's the picture he painted. 
unknown to me until just recently, by the way. Yeah. I, I was unaware of that. So, um, Joe Girard, some of you may know that name. Um, if, if you don't, maybe this will ring a bell a little bit. But uh, the Guinness Book of World Records labeled him the world's greatest car salesman. So, he sold Chevrolets and, I mean, thousands of them. Um, it, every month, he would sell thousands of, of Chevys. So they interviewed him and, and, and asked him, you know, what do you do? Like, what's your secret? You've, you have risen above every other salesman in the United States or in the world, really. So what's your secret? So he, he said, well, basically it's these two principles. Um, you compliment people and you look attractive. You look presentable. That's it. So what he would do is he would take every single customer and on birthdays, uh, like special events, anniversaries, Christmas, things like that, he would mail every single customer a handwritten card. He would handwrite every single one, so it's time-consuming. But he would, uh, he would write these three words on every single card, and every single card was exactly identical. I like you. I knew you'd say that. Yep. There is such a longing inside of us to be liked mm-hmm. by someone. We don't care who it is. And we're all there, whether we want to admit it or not. We want people to like us. We truly do. Yeah. So that's a powerful, powerful, powerful thing. You know, when you compliment people, just using their name increases compliance because people like to hear their name. And that, uh, they're, you know, psychologists have studied this for a long time. Um, there are all kinds of studies that show, they demonstrate when somebody uses your name, it creates this emotional bonding that makes you feel special. Well, it makes it you feel, uh, welcomed Absolutely. and, and like somebody remembers, and, somebody knows mm-hmm. my name, somebody embraces the person that I am. Now, lest we're misunderstood. We're not saying that every person who compliments you or knows your name or greets you or sends you a birthday card is an abuser mm-hmm. or planning no, not at all. one. But we're saying that the abusers learn these methods of how to get you to be compliant. Yes. And so that's the, the covert nature of abuse is that it doesn't feel like abuse oftentimes not at all not uh, now we're not saying okay and, and you might be thinking well you mean to tell me when a child gets raped um it doesn't feel like abuse that's not what we're saying yeah but you don't look at that person and think oh he's an ogre or a monster mm-hmm. it's such a confusing emotional game played in, on a child that I don't know how they do have sanity. Mm-hmm. I really don't. When your preacher, your friend, your doctor, whoever it is, then betrays you in such a yeah, way. What somebody I, what, that likes what I'm, you. What I meant by that is that uh, I should have reframed that. Uh, what I meant was from the outsider who's right. not an abuse okay. victim – Right. Um, they don't look like an abuser. No. They don't. They, it's somebody they who don't. you like, who you trust, which is, uh. And what I meant is this, what I said to, to the person who is the recipient of abuse is a tormenting emotional, mm-hmm. uh, tug of war because this person that you thought really did like you, mm-hmm. that really had your best interest at hand, betrays you in the worst unimaginable way Mm -hmm. and And then goes back to that likability factor yep back to being Being a likable person and yeah your best friends and you and mm -hmm. protecting you and Mm -hmm. and so it it is a torment it is an emotional and physical torment so the fifth principle of influence is authority so that principle says this people follow others who look like they know what they're doing it's that plain and simple so this is kind of interesting. In, in the book, Robert Caldini mentions the Stanley Milgram um, study. And if you're not familiar with the Stanley Milgram study, you really need to look that up. Um, I'll, I'll mention it a little bit here, but you really need to go and, and actually look up that study because it is fascinating to me. Um, but it's, uh, it's also known as the mem- memory punishment study. 
So Stanley Milgram was actually um, testing this principle of authority. How far will people go? Uh, you know, we, we saw it with the German Nazis. Right. You know, the, these right. people did unimaginable evils. And Hitler wasn't really coercing his soldiers to do it. They just did, they it. Just did it. Because, well, we'll get into yeah. that. But, so, right. so what he did is he, he cloaked this study as a memory punishment study. So basically he, he, he had all actors except for the actual subject. So everybody in his study was an actor. So he had one person who was behind a glass window and they were hooked up to this um, supposed um, electrical impulse machine. On the other side of the window, um, there was a button and you could increase the amount of electric shock that went to that person who was on the other side of the glass. Now the person on the other side of the glass was an actor the person pushing the button was not an actor. Okay. That was the subject okay. of of this study. Beside that person, unbeknownst to them, was another actor who was a, a lab assistant or somebody who was, you know, in authority in this study. Dressed as such. Right. Okay. They, so, so they were dressed. They had the lab right. coat. Okay. They, they looked right. like an authority figure. They were an actor, but, but okay. the person pushing the button didn't know that. Right. So they were given instructions. They were said, we're testing memory. Um, and supposedly memory increases when there's a fear of some kind of a, a physical threat. So in other words, if you feel like you're going to be punished because you get an answer wrong, you're going to be more inclined to remember okay. something better, which is total is totally bogus. It's not, right. Mm -hmm. But the point of his study was to test this principle of authority. Okay. So... So they tell the people that and they say, we want you to push the button every time we give them a, a series of things to remember and they get a wrong answer. We want you to push the button. But every time that you push the button, um, we're going to increase the amount of voltage that goes to that person. So you have complete freedom that at any time, if you feel uncomfortable and you want to stop pressing that button or you feel that there's a, a, a safety concern for the person on the other side of the glass or they just seem troubled or traumatized or any of that, you can stop at any time. There's no penalty for that. We'll end the study when you stop pressing the button. So what was interesting in, in Milgram's study was that they were very dramatic with this. And so the one guy supposedly had a pacemaker or something like that. And he kept, of course, it was intentional, but he kept forgetting things. And so the the lab assistant would tell them, okay, increase it to the next voltage. It got to the point where the guy, the actor on the other side of the glass, was literally screaming and begging, saying, please stop, you're going to kill me. And each of the people who, who, uh, who were part of this study, the subjects of the study, 100% of the time, they pressed that button. Without any coercion, they were told they could stop at any time. They were told that if, if they sensed that the other person was in discomfort, they could stop. They literally were given freedom to stop at any time. But because that person was standing beside them and told them to increase the voltage and to push the button... They did. They did it. They did. 100% of the time... Milgram was absolutely blown away by this study. He never would have guessed that people were that compliant to an authority figure. Well, I'm shaking my head as I'm sitting here listening to you. And we talked about this prior to uh, this podcast. But in my own life, I've done the same thing. People in authority. Mm -hmm. I, there have been times I've known that what they're telling me is wrong. It's something mm -hmm. that I have not believed in. It's a wrong principle or it's a, it's an out and out lie. But because they are in authority, I've subjected and gone along with mm -hmm. it. I, and then later on, I, it's like, why did I do that? Or mm -hmm. why, what? Well, because they're the ones in, in authority. I'm mm -hmm. supposed to listen to them. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to do what they say. I'm supposed to look to them. 
So we fall into this trap in a thousand different ways. Yeah. Well, he mentions three things that, that really intensify this, um, this notion of authority that make us susceptible to, uh, to compliance. And that's titles. Titles are very important. So people tell me all the time, like, you need, you need to go and get your doctorate because mm-hmm. it's that credentialing, credentialing, right. cred, <laughs> credentialing that's that essential. Is straight, James. I know. <laughs> it's, it's the heat. Y'all know I hate heat <laughs> and it's, Blistering you know, I'm hot watching here. the heat just drip, or the sweat Ugh. dripping here. It's warm. We don't have air conditioning in Pennsylvania. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it. it's interesting because that's very true. But I'm like, I don't really care about credentialing. You know, I don't care about my credentials by telling people that I'm, in, you know, a quote unquote you expert, but at the, the same time. You are one, Jimmy. Yeah. Like, because. I don't have all my diplomas hanging on the wall and all that stuff. Cause I just don't care. Like, (laughs) but you are not the norm. The norm, um, is to number one, if we're the person that's looking for the authority, we look for those credentials Mm -hmm. and we are blown away by it. We Mm -hmm. are, and it doesn't matter. Uh, I've sat in audiences where speakers have been horrible uh, the information they've given has been blah. Mm-hmm. I've paid good money for it, but you walk away saying, wow, yeah. this was something because mm-hmm. he's a MIV, DVI, MGTA, mm-hmm. whatever, you know, yeah. and all those letters behind the name. And it's like, oh, so wow. he or she really knows what they're right. doing. They yeah. know what they're doing. Yeah. Titles are important. Uh, that really increases our, our, um, willingness to follow. Uh, clothing is important. It sure is. Um, there are all kinds of studies on this that, you know, people who, uh, reporters, people who don't look like reporters are not taken seriously when, when they hold a microphone up to somebody. People blow them off. They don't talk. When somebody dresses and looks like a reporter, people will stop. And not only that, not only do people want to be interviewed, but then you get all the photo bombers in the background. Like they just can't right. wait to be in the camera I'm, because they I'm might be on the news. You because one of my friends, and I will not mention his name, laughs telling this story. For 20 something years, he posed as a, a newspaper man <laughs> and got into all these ball games. Mm-hmm. And he, he just dressed mm-hmm. the, the part. And took a camera with him, and he got front row seats always, mm-hmm. and you know said he was there from this newspaper, and I won't say the name, but there to take photos. He got himself and family members in all the time mm-hmm. for free, and just laughed about. It. I mm-hmm. said, "How did you do it?" I dressed and looked like it. Yeah. I said, "I talked like one. I looked like played the role." Clothes are very important. Very. Uniforms, outfits. Um, you know, ministers look at what they wear. Um, I'm again the exception of the rule. I'm wearing shorts right now. I'm in bare feet. But <laughs> like, you're at you're at home. When I am, but when I'm at the office, I dress the same way. But when you're preaching, you will have a, a shirt. A dress Only because my wife and, makes me. I that is true. You probably have your sandals on, but um, the cloth, the the neck gear, the whole the cloak, the robe. Mm-hmm. We think reverence immediately. Mm-hmm. No matter who is under that robe, we yeah. immediately subject ourselves to that authority. Yeah. Just natural. Then the third part of that is trappings. So that's like the accessories, um, indirect cues that signal authority. So, uh, you know, again, like doctors, they put, um, all their, um, certificates and diplomas and all that stuff. They'll line their walls with it. Um, They'll hang stethoscopes around their neck. They'll, you know, they'll have all the trappings of a doctor so that when you see them, automatically your posture changes towards that person. It sure you does. view them as a, as yeah. a person who knows what they're right. doing. Um, and then this is kind of interesting too, because, you know, he, he says, if you have little authority, you place yourself in a role where you are the authority. I think that's probably key. Mm-hmm. To well, your friend did it. Today. Yeah, your friend yes. did it with uh, the <clears throat> posing as a newspaper person. Absolutely. Abusers do it this way. And this is something that we hear all the time. And my dad did this too. I mean, he wasn't in county jail for a week. 
And he was, he was writing me letters about how he's a spiritual mentor to all these younger inmates that are in there. And I'm just, you know, it's so wonderful because I'm the old head in prison and I'm the, you know, I'm this person who they respect. And that's a big thing to him, well, wanting to be to this, respected. And I know I share this with you, Jimmy. I worked with our sheriff's department. I was contracted with them at the time your dad was arrested. He had to be transported a couple times to different uh, prisons. The deputies came to me and they said, look, I, I know what he did. We, we know we were in court. We mm-hmm. understand what he did, but man, we like him. Mm-hmm. And I just looked at them. They said, he's, he's got a beautiful voice. He sang hymns the mm-hmm. whole time while we were transporting him. And I'm thinking, you are kidding me. Mm-hmm. He sang, I said, are you kidding me? They said, no, man, he's got a beautiful voice. And to hear him singing these hymns was mm-hmm. amazing. So there mm-hmm. you go. So he positions himself as, as the the uh, the authority for the um the choir thing. I, I could there's I'm laughing oh. I'm laughing inside because there's so much that I have in letters that you don't have a clue. You oh, don't you don't no. know that it has no, to do with music I, in in the prison. Leading oh he was choir director and all kinds of things in oh. prison. He's oh. never taken a music lesson in his life. No no but. He's got that beautiful voice and he can sing the hymns and he knows that's his way of getting you to, you know, you, you are then under his thumb. Yeah. So, so on the outside, what that looks like is in your church, in your family, whatever it is, they position themselves as a spiritual mentor. So Dave, the father of the victims that, that my dad was charged on, he said that when dad first met him, the very first time that he met him at church, he, you know, found out what his home life was like, which was a complete disaster, and he positioned himself immediately as a spiritual mentor. And he said, in Dave's words, he said, your dad said to me, you need a spiritual mentor. I will not forget that moment when I heard mm-hmm. Dave say that. And uh, it, So that was him clearly using this principle of authority. Is. He positioned himself as a spiritual mentor. Um and he did that because he wasn't in ministry at that point. Right. So he was, you know. He w- he befriended someone. He made that person feel special. He gave him his yep. time. Yeah, so like, likeability, likeability, reciprocity. Right he was using okay. all these principles. Yeah. Uh, commitment and consistency got him to commit to something little. Um, can we just spend time together and right. and you just tell me about, you know, tell me all your woes. From that um, it went to Bible studies. From that it went mm-hmm. to babysitting. And then, and then it went to the overnight, having the kids yeah. overnight. And so it was just this that clear progression. Built, it, and there was no forcing. Mm-mm, not at all. None at all. And then the last principle is scarcity, the principle of scarcity. People generally assume that when something is rare, it's better or mo- more valuable than things that are common. So we are drawn to things that are exclusive or they're difficult to obtain. So exclusive vacation, one-time offer. Um, this offer expires. If, if you don't call this hotline in, you know, 24 hours, this deal expires. Um, sale of how about century. mountain furniture in town? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell them, tell our listeners what they do. Oh, I'm just, every single, uh-huh. every single year they're Going out of business. They going they out have of been business going sale. out of business for the past for 10 years. years. And they'll sit chairs and things out. And too. it works. For you, it it's a brilliant it marketing it strategy because it, it works. Sure does. But every this year. This is your last time, people, that yeah. you can ever get this piece of furniture. Mm-hmm. And it draws people they'll, every time. They'll say, like, it's interesting. They never put a date when the store is closing. <laughs> but they I, always put, they'll have their signs out. Uh, I haven't seen them recently, but they'll be I, out. Oh, they're out. Going yeah. out of sale. They do that around holidays, especially. They're like going out of business. Can, yeah. 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 So, you know, think about that. Think about anything that's rare in life and exotic cars. Look at what people pay for just cars that the they, car they only that you produce. Think will not be. Yeah. And car dealerships do that all the time. Right. Like they, well, they sure. have one mm-hmm. line of their car. That they'll only produce like 25 models in a year. Yep. 25 of those in a year. One, 
people have. And look at what people oh. pay. They'll pay hundreds of thousands yeah. of dollars for a car that's no different than any other car except that it's yeah. scarce. Yeah. Well, yeah, scarcity has always produced a high demand, always. So think about concerts, you know, backstage passes. Look at what people pay for them. Like to to get a chance to go backstage and only only 20 people can go backstage. Well, you'll pay hundreds of dollars, if not thousands, to be for these tickets, to be one of the 20 that gets to go backstage and meet the band. Um, now, how does this relate? To abuse, though, how well, that? I'll, I'll I'll talk about that here in a second. You know, um, you know, a couple. I, I wanted to read this real quick. Um, there's an article that I want to read, just a couple sentences, but I want to talk about the cookie jar experiment too. Um, in this experiment, they took two cookie jars with the exact same cookies. In one jar, there were ten cookies. In the other jar, there were two cookies. They told people to rate the cookies. How good do they taste? Identical, identical cookies. cookies. Okay. And the uh, the 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 cookie jar that only had the two cookies in it, the the ratings were dramatically much better, dramatically better. Absolutely. And they said, you know, they're so delicious. They're wonderful. They were excellent. I want more. <laughs> so this this principle of scarcity is very powerful. Now within scare, scarcity. Um, this is where it gets scary because the media, they, they understand this principle and they do something called censorship. So they'll censor things or give the appearance of censorship. And this is what Robert Caldini says about that in his book. So he says, um, the intriguing thing about the effects of censoring information is not that audience members want to have the information more than they did before. That seems natural. Mm -hmm. So in other words, no duh. You know, right. if, if people limit something, do it with your kids. Right. Tell them that mm -hmm. they can limit their time on their iPad. Mm -hmm. Look at what that rule of scarcity does. <laughs> they want more. <laughs> they do. They want more, 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 more. <laughs> we are wired that way in the brain from birth. Um, so he says, you know, that's not what's intriguing. Rather, it's that they come to believe in the information more, even though they haven't received it. In other words, the message was never put out. It was censored. Okay. It was protected. Right. And so without ever releasing that information, we're able to radically shift people's perspective about what they think they, hides behind right. the censorship. Okay. Right. So, for example, he says, when University of North Carolina students learned that a speech opposing co-ed dorms on campus would be banned, they became more, uh, uh, more opposed to the idea of co-ed dorms. Okay, so it said, thus, without ever hearing the speech, they became more sympathetic to its argument. This raises the worrisome possibility that especially clever individuals holding a weak or unpopular position can get us to agree with that position by arranging to have their message restricted. The irony is that for such people... Members of fringe political groups, for example, the most effective strategy may not be to publicize their unpopular views, but to get those views officially censored, and then to publicize the censorship. That's powerful. Isn't that amazing? That is very powerful. Blows my mind. Yes. Very powerful. So how do abusers use that? Well, uh, well, just the basic principle of scarcity. Remember the letter that we read two podcast episodes ago? The letter that my dad wrote that... He wanted to be the the part-time youth minister and blah, 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 blah. At the end of the letter, what's interesting is you see these principles, all six of these in that letter. Go back and listen I to sure that episode. Do. Oh, they you stand out You see all really six like a principles neon sign. in that letter. Yes. And what I'm finding is that in all of his letters that I receive now, I can see you all can six of these principles. This. Absolutely. Yeah. Every time. Hundred percent of the time. That's why this is so important for you as as our listeners to grasp this, mm -hmm. to understand it. Write it down if you have to. These principles. Get the book. Yeah, they're easy learn, to memorize. Right. Learn them because you'll see the pattern. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead. Jim. So in, in that letter, if you recall, at the very end, he said, "This is intended to be a one-time offer. Yep. You okay. have two weeks to make your decision, or else what." He's withdrawing. He's, yep. he's not going to 
He's offers going to take no, his services no elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Available. I'll still love you as brothers. Yeah. I'll still worship but as I can. Be the youth pastor or the youth counselor, whatever he called himself. He's taken it off the table. Yep. So he's using the principle of scarcity. Sure. Now it didn't work. No. Um, Thankfully. Thankfully. But it is a highly effective oh, technique. Sure. So, yeah, it's interesting, but the, but the, that other part, the censorship, where that works is with sex offenders who've been outed, okay? So sex offenders that have been outed, they can rewrite the narrative and they can censor certain facts about, about what they want people to believe about sex offenders without ever saying it. They don't have to say it. They can just give little bits of information and radically change people's minds about the about any given subject, about grace, about mercy, about forgiveness, they can they can censor certain information. So they can say things like, well, I have this Bible study on, on forgiveness, if you ever want to see it. Well, nine and a half times out of ten, nobody's going to want to see it for, for no other reason than we're all just busy. Right. But they'll put it out there and they'll say something like, I developed this Bible study on forgiveness. And I think it'd be a really good study for the church. That plants such a seed in our minds that what a an mm-hmm. awesome person this person is. And that forgiveness be, is important. Yes. To be taking time to to get this message out about the importance of forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And there you look at that person and without them saying it. He softened your view on, uh, on oh, forgiveness. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and increased we get sucked into it. And he's Truly increased did. your interest in not only studying forgiveness but exercising it. Absolutely. Th- these are powerful principles and I'm telling you there is a multitude of ways that these can be applied and that they are being applied. And I think we really need to understand these six principles. I I I'll say it again. If you don't have this book, run to get it. Get it on Kindle. Uh, I ordered it on Kindle. When I read the little blurb right. about the yeah. book a few years ago, mm-hmm. I, I I like traditional books. I like to hold a book in my hand. I ordered this on Kindle because I just had to have it. Um, maybe Robert Caldini messed with my <laughs> mind and got me to order his book. Rats! <laughs> These principles, though, are so on target with how abusers work, that it's important that we study this, that we learn the principles, that we know how to dissect behaviors and the way people are using these principles to get to our children. Yeah, and, and and I'll I'll close with this, and then I'll give the truth, Mom. Um, what what I tell people all the time is we have the wrong perspective. Okay, we're on the we're standing on the outside and we're looking. F- for abusers. We're like, tell me, you know, people ask me fairly often. They're like, can you give me a a checklist of things that I need to look for, for the abusers? My response is that's only the smallest part of the equation. The bigger part of the equation is teaching you to think like one of these guys to understand these principles and, and, and to look for us. We need to start looking for Mm -hmm. ourselves how is it that abusers look for their targets? How is it that, that they find vulnerable people? How is it that they exploit vulnerable people? And so that's what I like about understanding and, and studying Robert Caudini's um, principles of, of influence or persuasion, um, because that teaches you in a benign way how to mm-hmm. think like an abuser. What is it that they're looking for in us? And how do we be aware so that when they're using these principles – we can say, wait a second, I know what you're doing. I know what you're right. up to. We That's, need to equip people t- to be able to do that. And it's a whole different way of thinking. Living as the wife of an abuser, I can think of a hundred different ways where your dad had me so convinced about things that, mm-hmm. that were so foreign and so outstretched, but he knew what he was doing. He positioned yeah. himself in such a way that he had it nailed with mm-hmm. me. He really did. Not so, another time, another story. But yeah. truth bomb, Jimmy. All right. Our truth bomb is this. Watch for people who position themselves as an authority. Be very careful who you follow. 
Don't just blindly follow somebody because they're credentialed up. Don't just blindly follow somebody because they're likable or they like you. Don't just blindly follow somebody because they have limited availability in their schedule that they can visit with you. Don't just blindly follow somebody because uh, they look like you, you know, social proofing. Don't just follow somebody because you said that you would do something, but you later changed your mind and you don't want to be inconsistent. Uh, don't just follow somebody because of that. Um, reciprocity. Uh, don't just follow somebody because you reciprocated kindness back to them and then they gave it back to you. Be very careful who you follow and just be aware. So we're not saying uh, be paranoid, but just be know aware. who you're following. Absolutely be aware. Thank you for listening to this episode and we'll catch you next time. Thanks again for listening to today's episode of the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast. If you found it helpful, please follow on Spreaker, subscribe on Google Play Music, Apple Podcasts, or Stitcher. Share with your friends and tell the world. Join us in speaking out on sex abuse so we can change the tides and prevent abuse.